I've had my kiln now for about two years and been operating it pretty continuously, although the way I've been operating it has changed quite a bit. So I'm gonna cover a bit of that in this video. It's gonna bounce around a little bit. It's held up pretty well though. The panels here have yellowed a little bit and they're a little bit more brittle. It doesn't help that the goats try to chew on it. I got some wild turkeys walking around. Have you seen my goats? Come on, get, get. They're not so wild, they belong to a neighbor. And we just had Thanksgiving, so I think they're probably safe now. I need to put more screws in because when it gets really hot in there, they do contort a bit or they expand and they twist. And they probably let out a bit more heat than I would like out, the, out this side of the kiln. One of the things I'm doing differently now is when I first started, I was really loading up the kiln. Uh, this kiln can hold a, between 750 and 1,000 board feet. And I was initially putting the five or 600 board feet in it, but I really lose control of the temperature then. And my goal is to get it to about 130 degrees uh, towards the end of the drying process. Right now I've got about 100 board feet of walnut in here. It is fall, we're going into winter, but fall, winter, spring, I will keep it to about 100 board feet, maybe a little bit more towards the early fall or late spring going into summer. Uh, I have a much better control of temperature with smaller loads. Uh, with a big load there, you have a big thermal mass and it takes a while for that wood, the internal temperature of that wood to start heating up. So if I keep the loads pretty small, I keep the vents closed, uh, I can easily just open or close a vent to regulate the temperature and I still get up to about 130 degrees even in the winter. So why 130 degrees? Well, that is the generally accepted temperature that if you can get the internal temperature of the wood to and hold that for an hour, that should kill any bugs inside the wood. Now, I normally just have my kiln kind of running on autopilot. I have some of the vents open and while I'm home because I'm traveling for work, I just speed up the process. But when it gets to that eight to 10%, I close the vents and I try to get that wood temperature as high as I can for as long as I can. The fans have held up pretty good, but this little one here, sometimes it takes a little push start to get going. Uh, I ordered a replacement for it, uh, but it started working just fine again. And if the sun was to hit that panel, it would start up just fine. So not ready to be replaced just yet. One project I need to do in the future is get this ground level by the kiln. Uh, even though for the area I'm in, my land is considered to be fairly flat, it's not. Uh, so when I come up here with my tractor, I can't just drop the load of wood here. Uh, I've got to unstack it from the tractor. So it would be nice if I could load it and sticker it down by the barn, just come up here to the kiln, drop it in here with the forks and back away. And because I'm only drying between 100 and 150 board feet at a time, I certainly didn't need to make it this big. And if I could do it over again, I would change that. One, I've been pretty good about keeping my log lengths to 10 foot, so I don't need to be so wide. Uh, 14 foot is an inefficient use of building materials. I would go with 12 foot. And if I could load it with my forklift or my, the forks on my tractor, I certainly wouldn't need to get into the kiln or one of us on either side of the, the, the wood to stack it in there. So I would make it about 12 foot and I'm only doing about two rows usually. So it doesn't need to be this depth either. I'm not sure what it would look like, but it certainly wouldn't have to be this big. One of the changes I made to the kiln was I put a permanent baffle going across the kiln. I always found it a bit of a pain to manipulate the tarp to seal on the top pieces of the wood. So what I did was just put that baffle in and now I make up the difference with a piece of wood and that tarp is pretty much just permanently installed there. I made a video not too long ago covering the internal temperature of the wood uh, throughout the day and I'll put a link to it up there in the corner. But what I found is uh, another issue with the kiln is I've got a hot spot towards that side of the kiln. I'm not sure why that's the sun hits that side first in the mornings. Um, or maybe I just need more airflow going through the kiln. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do about that. I think adding a fan wouldn't be a bad thing to do anyways. So to get more wind or more airflow going across the wood might keep the temperature a bit more consistent. So this is my barn where I air dry the lumber after I cut it with a sawmill. 
I like to let it air dry as long as possible, or at least till it gets below 20% moisture content before I take it to the kiln. I'm not sure where it was when I started, but I needed more capacity and I found like an old trailer, uh, like a trailer home, and I used the steel from that to make some steel platforms or some old pallet racking. And now I have about 11 uh, bunks where I can air dry about 5,000 board feet of lumber before I take it down to the kiln. One reason I like to air dry the lumber as long as possible in the barn is that some types of wood and some parts of wood really like to hold on to that moisture more than others. Uh, walnut's pretty good at drying, but if there's any figure in that wood, that's going to hold on to moisture longer. So the, the lower I can get the moisture content in the barn before bringing it into the kiln, the shorter it takes in the kiln to dry it and it's more consistent, a better quality product before I move it into the shop. Here's a little tip for you. If you go shopping for lumber, take a moisture meter with you. Uh, nobody should mind if you're going around and checking the lumber you're about to buy. Uh, I'm sure everyone would prefer that you used a pinless style. This one here does not have pins and it measures up to three quarters of an inch into the wood. And don't just check one spot on the piece of wood you're interested in. Check a variety of spots. A piece of wood that has some straight grain and some figure in it, uh, like some curl that was near a branch or something like that, uh, is going to have two different moisture contents. That curly bit or the figure is going to be harder and it's going to hold on to the moisture more than the area of the wood that has the straight grain. Once the wood leaves the barn and goes through the kiln, it always goes into my shop, never back into the barn. Uh, once it's in the shop, I can keep a close eye on it, make sure there's no little piles of sawdust coming out of it, which would mean that there's something still alive in that wood. To this point, I still have never found anything alive in my shop once it's gone through the kiln. Another way to mitigate having insects in the lumber is when you cut those trees down. Uh, in spring and summer, the trees are full of sugar uh, because the tree is growing, and in the winter, the tree is more dormant. So. If you cut a tree in the winter, you're not going to have as many sugars in the wood, so it's not as appetizing to bugs. Also, just a quick note on wood boring insects. Uh, just because something came out of a kiln a couple of years ago doesn't mean that it's still bug free. If it's been stored in a, under a lean to or in a barn like mine, there's nothing to keep bugs out of it if it's the most appetizing thing around. And if you do come across that ad for the barn full of kiln dried lumber, uh, it's probably no longer between 8 and 10%. It's been sitting outside or in a garage. Uh, just like when I pull the wood out of my kiln, it's always between 8 and 10%. And I'll bring it in here, and if that's at the beginning of summer, by the end of summer, it's going to be between 8 and 12%. I don't air condition my shop, so the humidity gets in here, and of course that gets into the wood. Kiln-dried material will just take on moisture a lot slower than non-kiln-dried material. The cell walls will collapse and they just don't take on moisture as fast. What happened? You saw some turkeys and you ran off. Have you never seen turkeys before? Are you afraid of turkeys? I had a good lesson earlier this year. Some friends and I were able to buy out a retiring cabinet maker. He had 35 years of accumulation of that 10% extra hardwood he would order for every job. And so he had racks filled with all sorts of different hardwood. And we made him an offer for the whole thing. It was a good deal for him, a good deal for us. And it was about six trailer loads. And we got it all the way back up to my shop here. We divvied it all up. And then we had a whole bunch extra that we were going to try and sell. And I listed them all individually on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, there was red oak, white oak, walnut, maple, mahogany, Brazilian cherry, regular cherry, uh, listed them all individually, had a very hard time selling them all, uh, except for walnut. People want walnut. So I took that as a lesson and I have been trying to concentrate on getting walnut logs and milling them ever since. Over the last two years, I've learned a lot about milling lumber and drying it, and I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, if you have any questions though, list them down below. I will answer them to the best of my ability. And uh, anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.